Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. You'll also find our archives where you can listen to every episode we've ever done going back to 2006. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is September 9th, 2016, and my guest is Casey Mulligan, professor of economics at the University of Chicago. He has written widely on labor markets and in particular the disincentive effects of various government programs. His latest book is Side Effects and Complications, the Economic Consequences of Healthcare Reform, and he appeared on Econ Talk in 2012 to discuss his book, The Redistribution Recession. Casey, welcome back to Econ Talk. Well, thank you. I'm so glad that we have the freedom to enjoy a program like yours. Well, there is something special about the United States, um, and I say that because our topic for today is your recent trip to Cuba, uh, which uh, I found fascinating. You wrote it up on your blog, Supply and Demand, and we'll put a link up to that post. Uh, how did it come about that you went to Cuba? How did you um, how'd you get there? Because Although there have been some lifting of restrictions, it's not so easy to get there, is my understanding. Well, I mean, there's some background to it in that um, I've been teaching public sector economics in Chicago most of my career. And a couple of aspects that I I found important to look at, and one is the democracy or non-democracy aspect of public sectors you know, whether the elections are competitive or not, and the regulation and planning aspect. Um, and we, I teach a lot of that in my class, but most of it out of a book, and I wanted to to see that. Um, and my wife and I, not too long ago, had gone to China, thought maybe, well, that's maybe a communist country, and we could see some of those things. They, they certainly do have the non-democracy aspect, but the the planning aspect of it is, is long gone. So we got home, we said, well, maybe uh, maybe we should go to Cuba or North Korea or something like that. At the time, it wasn't clear how to how to achieve that, you know, whether we would be allowed. Um, but the... Um, is your wife an economist, Casey? No. That's an unusual uh, vacation uh, concept for, for some people. Hey, honey, let's go do some... <laughs> To a, to a horrible dictatorship for vacation. You're a very um, understanding wife, I, it seems to me. Well, it was always clear we were going to be able to come home, so that <laughs> that's important. You're a good husband. So anyway, so you decided you should try North Korea or Cuba, and how'd you get into Cuba? Um, well, it looks like that uh, our government really opened opportunities for Americans to go there. I, I think Canadians and Germans have been going there for a lot longer. But uh, anyway, they started showing up on on tour groups as, as a possible destination. So um, our kind of calendars lined up. And so we went, um, we signed up to go. And then the next week we heard that our mayor of Chicago was also going with his family and then Obama's were going as well. So there must have been something that happened in terms of Americans getting access there. That's my understanding. It's party time. Yeah. Mulligans, Obamas, and Emmanuels head to, <laughs> to Cuban paradise. Uh, how long did you go for? How long were you there for? We were there a week. And just in terms of planning, can you get on the internet and explore things about Cuba from the United States? Can you can you do things like, oh, I wonder what it would be interesting to look at? Uh, where should I stay? Where can I eat? Or did you kind of have to arrange that on the fly once you got there? Well, I, I, both of those approaches could be taken, but I, I used a tour group that I'd used before, um, and they really handle everything. Um, and, and what they had explained to me that um, – of course, they're, they're very sensitive to their customers and what their customers like. Um, tend to be, I guess, be older people, Americans. But um, the Cuban government presents them with a, really a menu of things that they can do with the tour group, places they can go, people they can interview. Um, and the tour group chooses from that menu. 
So in that experience, how much freedom did you have to explore things or pe- talk to people who were not sort of pre-approved by the tour group through the government? We would have um, several hours, uh, I would say, a day um, that the tour didn't schedule things for us. And therefore, we could we were free to wander off. You know, the police wouldn't stop us if we took a taxi into the middle of the country or just walk down the street and talk to people, um, which which we did for sure. That um, went in some stores. Uh, that was one of our main goals is to try to see it unscripted. And before we talk about what you saw, uh, presumably you went to Cuba with some preconceived notions about their economy. Um, I would you might call them biases. You could call them priors. Um, how much do you think that colored what you saw when you were there and how you saw it? Do you think? Did you have the – were you conscious of, of that when you were there and did you try to push back against that and look for things that might not agree with your priors? Well, um, the, I guess one of the priors I had was that the Cuban people would not like the Castros or the regime or the party. Um. And I learned that they didn't, maybe they don't like them, but not quite in the way that I I thought. Um, I had thought I know that Che Guevara is very popular around the United States in, in, cer- in certain circles, college students and so on. And I, I had thought that maybe they wouldn't like the guy, but they actually liked liked him in various ways. Uh, they they thought he was a good example. You know, he would roll up his sleeves and do the dirty work that they were forcing the citizens to do as well. So uh, I guess that was the the biggest surprise that I had. Um, and I started to understand that, you know, the Cuban Americans and the Cuban Cubans, they're, they're different on this. And most of the exposure that I had had in terms of meeting people who are Cuban or reading what Cubans have to write about Cuba, they're from the Cuban Americans, um, and they're they're more angry uh, toward toward the regime than uh, the people living there. Yeah, part of that's selection bias, obviously. Some of it could be right. The angriest people would be more likely to leave, perhaps. It could be the fact that once you're there, you may as well make the best of it, um, or it could be just that those people who are left behind have better lives for a variety of reasons, care about different things and are somewhat content. So what you wrote is that, you know, you, you sensed a reasonable or quite a bit of pride in the Cuban system f- um, from the people at least that you talked to. Is that accurate? Um, it's a little bit exaggerated. There, there were, I witnessed some proud moments for them. Um, they, in, in particular, an episode that that I read about and that people talk about was in the early '60s. I guess it was Che Guevara's idea, but certainly the Castro supported it, uh, a literacy program for the country. And so they took kids out of really high school in the cities, and they, these were they were literate because they were in high school and they're in the city, and they sent them out to the country. Um, to help with the farm work during the day, which I'm sure the farmers appreciated and then teach the farmers to read at night. And then that, that was, uh, I don't think a nine month program or something like that. And uh, then at the end, each of the farmers wrote a letter to Castro, you know, with their new skills. Um, And the the teenager who people, the teenagers are proud of that today. They're of course, they're not teenagers anymore. Um, and the rural people, I think, look favorably on that. Um, and it was really the government's idea. So that that I thought people were generally proud of. There was other talk about things like, well, we, you know, the Cubans participate in this international conference and that international conference. I don't perceive that they were all that proud of it. It was more just parroting some of the bullet points that I think the state newspaper puts out. 
you do hear, uh, we'll talk later about healthcare, but you hear that when, when I debate or discuss Cuban economics with uh, sympathizers, they always mention the high literacy rates and the great healthcare. We'll talk about healthcare in a minute. Uh, but let's just start with some basics of just walking around the street. One thing you remarked on is that uh, many of the buildings you saw were not doing very well. Uh, tell us what you saw and why you think uh, what explains it. Yeah, what, the, right out of the airport, um, I noticed the, the very first thing I noticed was just the complete lack of advertisements. That's the first thing I saw. Maybe we can come back to that. But then uh, within a few minutes after that, I was amazed at how crumbling the, the buildings were. At first, you know, the airport's inland, and at first I thought, okay, we're in maybe in a rough neighborhood or whatever. And, of course, the buildings aren't going to be that great. Yeah, the buildings um, near, near O'Hare or mid, <laughs> midway in Chicago sometimes don't look so healthy either. Uh, but go ahead. So then but when we got out to the waterfront, and it's like the same story, that the buildings were, you know, falling down. Uh, they were – and sometimes they were a half a pile of rubble, sometimes a whole pile of rubble. Um, and, you know, paint is long gone, it later last painted in 1958, maybe. I, um, they were really in bad shape. Um, very l little new stuff. There were some renovated things, especially around where they took the Pope. Um, but people were living in these buildings that were were falling apart. And if it rained, it, it did rain a number of times when we were there, especially in the afternoon, you know, it would fall apart even more. And so some people would hit the point that day where they had to be moved out because it was no longer safe by any stretch of the word to, to live in those premises anymore. So that's hard to believe, right? For somebody who hasn't been there, you know, I'm, uh, I've never been to, to Cuba. I, I wrote uh, a book that had a Cuban element in it, and I did a little bit of reading for that. I've seen a lot of pictures, which tend to show colorful cars and interesting-looking buildings. You don't get the imp the impression you're giving is that it's the city is say Havana is in in dis literal disrepair. It's in it's not like oh I saw a building that was falling apart. It's like common. Is that correct? Yes, it's common. And the other thing that came to my mind. It I had read this book um, on rent control um, that a number of people contributed. I think Milton Friedman, Ed Olson was uh, uh, one of the main editors. I think maybe Walter Block was as well. Um, and in that book, on kind of alternating pages, they would show a picture of a bombed out uh, part of a city that had been bombed. And then they'd show a picture of part of a city that had been subject to rent control. And then they were trying to, they asked the reader, can you guess which is which? And it was hard. And I, I actually know Ed Olson a little bit. I, I thought, boy, you guys are really exaggerating. And I was a little surprised that Ed would do that. But that's the first thing I thought of when I got there. And I was like, wow, they, these places kind of look like they've been bombed, but there's been no bombs. It's, it's been an economic system that acted like a bomb. Um, I think part of that. Part of the reason I, I owned that book, I don't, I don't know if I could put my hands on it, but I used to have, I had that book at one point in my life. And, uh, you know, being a free market guy was, and a big anti price control guy, I always loved that book. But, you know, you, you have to face the fact that in San Francisco and in New York City, and I'm sure maybe Chicago, I don't know, you know, there is, quote, rent control. Now, it's not rent control the way it was originally maybe implemented in some cities. Um, they put a lot of exceptions in and a lot of ways to create some incentives while trying to keep the rent low for certain tenants. So I think part of the reason that book seems so provocative is that it's hard for us to relate to it if we don't know the historical examples that those are capturing, right, where there were the no exceptions. You're suggesting, though, that uh, that in Cuba, there's just – there's zero incentive to take care of the buildings. Who who owns them and why aren't they being repaired? Why aren't people fixing them? Well, ownership is a is a little blurry. Um, for most of the regime, the state owned it, but the people who lived there, you know, they had the the right to live there. So when 
the time came for them to move, they would receive some kind of payment from the government. So you could say they were selling it to the government, or you could say it's a, a bonus for vacating your property, what, either way. Um, but they couldn't sell it to a, a, a third party, and, and the payment wasn't based on you know how well they maintained it or anything. Um, then pretty recently, I'd say in the last five years, they um, people are allowed to sell and buy properties. I think you can have a maximum of two or three or something like that. Um, so there is a resale market now. Um, so that's one aspect of the property rights. You, for most of the time, it wasn't really owned um, by people. The other aspect of it is the property rights in the apartment buildings, um, I learned, was was unclear. Um, of course, the inside of your apartment would be yours, um, but what about the common areas? Um, what about the roof? Does that belong to the people who live on the top floor or everybody? And it wasn't clear, and so nothing, not much got done about keeping roofs under repair. Um, and actually, some of these buildings, as they start to fall apart, you get new common areas. Or it's hard to... You know, the property lines aren't so clear when the building's splitting apart and crumbling. Um, and so you have area of these buildings, it's not clear who owns them, um, but people are using them. And you talk about uh, this phenomenon of dividing uh, the story of a building essentially into two stories, creating apartments. I don't know how to describe it exactly. You want to try the barbecue phenomenon? Yeah, so the um, the the buildings there were really all, most of them were built either in the 20s or in the 50s. They, they were the, kind of their two building booms. Um, and they, in terms of the size and structure, um, it was pretty similar to what we would build here. People kind of like kind of large rooms, uh, maybe a little bit taller ceilings than we would have due to the heat and everything. Um, but now it, people are, don't live in that kind of luxury, and they really want a smaller place. And so they divide these places up um, by, you can imagine putting in a wall, okay? But then they also put in a new ceiling between the old floor and the old ceiling. Um, and they call the, that upper floor, if you will, or the, you might call it a loft. Um, they call that a barbecue because it gets hotter up there in that top half of, of the room. And then it'll have, there'll be a little hole in the new floor slash ceiling um, and a ladder up up the wall that people would climb up there. And they tend to do their sleeping up there and their uh, maybe some storage. Um, so they've expanded the square footage by a, really a factor of two. Not the cubic footage, of course, but the square footage. I was um, I found it poignant when you talked about there are some special regulations for boats. How'd you tell us what those are and how you found out fishing boats, how you found out about them? Well, the... I'm actually quite interested in boats just as recreation. And so I wanted to see what the boating situation there. I'd heard something about, well, the, it's not easy to get a boat if, if you're a Cuban uh, citizen. And so I was there, I looked around and, and I also asked about the fishing. And there was not a whole lot of fishing. And the fishermen that I saw were in very small boats, a smaller than what I would call a rowboat. Um, they, they kind of operate it like a rowboat, but it was a very small boat. And I was amazed that you, you could fish, you know, without getting swamped. Um, but I would see guys out there in the morning in these very small boats. And I would presume that the reason they're allowed to have a boat like that is because you can't take it anywhere offshore, um, for example, to Miami. So um, that's what they were doing. And as a result, the fishing industries not very productive. You know, how much fish can you catch in a little boat like that? Um, and so amazingly, a country like that uh, imports uh, its fish. So for, to the extent that fish is eaten in Cuba, it's going to be, uh, the vast majority is going to be imported. Meanwhile, I saw a fishing tournament there that was all foreigners. Um, so they held a tournament and looked like fun and people brought their boats from from Miami or um, maybe Europeans who happen to be in the area. And these are nice fishing boats, and they, they caught a lot of fish. 
um, recreationally. But the Cubans don't have things like that. What did you eat while you were there? Uh, and how did you eat it? Uh, there were, you know, I know there are restaurants in people's homes. Um, how, what kind of, how'd, the, how'd that work on the tour? Yeah, there, it was, I really liked the tour company and they, they, they took care of us well. So we were not eating like the locals. Um, and a number of the stops were in private restaurants um, that were maybe part of somebody's house. Um, they've, they've recently allowed, in the last three, four years, they've allowed restaurants to be an actual business, you know, with a boss and a payroll. Um, so we met employees who, who work for the restaurant and um, were an official employee. And they were, their customers were tourists. Um, they are nice restaurants. Um, they, every once in a while, they would apologize that they didn't have this flavor or that flavor because it is hard to find the, the ingredients. Um, so even in the fancy places, we saw an element of that. And to give an idea of the price, it was about what it would cost in Chicago to go to nice restaurants. So that would be, you'd be talking months wages for, for the Cubans. Um, so you can imagine if they have trouble finding ingredients at that level, that um, how hard it is for Cubans in general to find ingredients to make dishes that they might like. Did you see any... Uh, black market cash transactions? Um, kind of a personal question. Maybe maybe <laughs> you don't want to answer that. Well, uh, yeah, I'm just trying to think in my mind how much of it was tourist specific um, versus, versus locals. Um, I mean, I assume, I assume if you want to buy something in Cuba – you can use dollars, American dollars. Is that correct? No, um, and not literally. Um, they they have a currency there that's really only used by the tourists. That's one to one with the U.S. dollar. This is pegged to the U.S. dollar. There's there's a hefty fee that comes out. So, but it's hmm. it's designed to be one to one with the U.S. dollar. Um, I understand that there are. Stores, I didn't go in any of these stores. There are stores that the locals can use dollars. So, um, and they would be getting, and I understand they can use regular U.S. dollars, um, and they're getting those U.S. dollars from relatives in the U.S. Did you get any beef? Yes. We had beef. All the beef is imported. I think it's 100% of the beef is imported because of the crime to kill a cow. So why is that? Why is it? A, they have cows, right? They Small do. Number, not a big number, but there are cows. They, they do have cows. Um, they're government owned. And they're for milk, which there's quite a sh shortage of milk, but um, they're, they're for milk. And they're, they wouldn't want a non-owner of the cow to kill it and use it for the beef. Um, <clears throat> I Listeners recently complained, I don't quote my favorite Hayek quote enough, but it does remind me uh, the curious task of economics is to demonstrate to men how little they really know about what they imagine they can design. Is that here we have this bizarre world of uh, state ownership, worrying about milk, uh, these strange consequences, can't get beef. Um, when I read your account of this, I was thinking back to a story, I actually found it on the web. From 2004, uh, from the Chicago Tribune, it says, in communist, China, in communist Cuba, only the state is allowed to slaughter cattle and sell the meat. At least this was then, this is 2004. Citizens who kill a cow, even if they raised it themselves, can get a 10-year prison sentence. Anyone who transports or sells a poached animal can get locked up for eight years. My brother-in-law got a 12-year prison sentence for killing 12 cows, said an accountant who lives in the cattle-raising region. But it's not uh, this is the crazy part. But it's not unheard of for Cubans to sneak into a pasture at night and butcher a cow on the spot. Residents have been known to descend on a cow struck by lightning, carving it up in minutes. Even though the meat often is charred, and they risk a fine if caught by police. 
The same thing can happen if a cow is hit by a car, dies of illness or malnutrition in giving birth or of old age. Even the residents admit the law requires them to leave the carcass alone and notify local officials. Um, then it remarks some. It talks about someone who works at a large dairy farm he, who recounted how scores of people scrambled to a nearby railway with knives and machetes when word spread that more than a dozen cattle had been struck by a passing train. So some of the, at least then, some of the. I mean, that just is crazy stories, but. So there was some cattle, I assume, raised for some kind of beef, maybe, not just for milk, not just cows for milk, do you think? Um, I saw a number of cows. They didn't have a lot of beef on them, um, but it, it could be that they're doing that. It, the types of regulations that you mentioned from that story, the, the Cubans volunteered that sort of those sort of rules that, that even when we were there, they were saying that, that, yeah, they're, they're tough on the cows and accounting for them. And when, when they died and why they died, it, they're more interested in a, the circumstances of a dead cow than a dead person. It's unusual. Um, let's talk about grocery stores. Did you go in some? Could you go in some? We were discouraged uh, from that. Uh, that's what our our tour company told us. And then I did go in some, and when I would go in, there would be Cubans who discouraged us. Um, but but we went in. They now you called it a grocery store. They're on a rationing system, so you, this, the families get a book. Even to this day, they they get a a ration book. Um, that gives them permission to buy a certain number of units at the uh, state price. Um, and so these stores that, that I went into, we can call them a grocery store, they, they just had grocery items that the government was distributing with the ration books. I believe you could also buy over and above your ration at, at another higher price. Um, there wasn't a whole lot in these stores, that maybe, I don't know, a dozen or two dozen distinct items. Um, they came very large packages. So a big can of canned mangoes was one of the items I saw. Just um, like Costco. It's the same principle as Costco, yeah. I think, because they want it to be cheap. So minimum of packaging and so on. Uh, eggs, they were in trays. I believe they were... They were very large trays. I've never seen eggs in such big trays. I think they were 30 or 40 to a tray. Um, three liter bottles of soda, um, tall bottles, um, items like that. Um, and they would be, and I, I think milk, I didn't see the milk, but I understand that the milk was rationed to the um, members of the family who were less than seven years old. Um, they get a certain number of units, not enough, for that child to use for the entire month, but there's a certain number of units they'd buy at the state price. And the state price was, I don't know, like an eighth or maybe let's say an eighth of what it would be in the United States um, for, the, say for an egg on a per egg basis. Of course, you're not getting refrigeration, you're not getting packaging, you're not getting helpful store hours or even place to park or anything like that. But, um, that was about the pricing. So I once hosted a Russian family when they, they had first arrived in the United States. Uh, and I was uh, – our family was assigned to them uh, through the Jewish Federation. It was – a lot of Soviet Jews came out of – and Russian Jews came out uh, at, at various times. And to ease their transition to American life, sometimes they would be assigned a family to help them. So we volunteered to do that. And – one of the more interesting parts of that was taking them to the grocery store. And I I may have told the story before, but, you know, the the part that was fun, there were two things that were fun about it. One was uh, they, the produce section just was a source of tremendous fascination and uh, amazement to them. And then the second part was that though we didn't speak Russian and they didn't speak English, um, the mother of the family communicated that she wanted to make bread and she wanted to buy yeast. 
So yeast is a very small item. It's physically small. It's hard to find in a store. A couple obvious places to look. We couldn't, we looked, we didn't see it. So we asked a person in this, one of the employees to help if there's any extra yeast in the back. And they went in the back and uh, found some and brought it out to me. And the Russian woman looked at me with like a new sense of respect. <laughs> like, ah, like he's important. He gets the yeast. So I tried to explain to her that now nah, really anyone could get the yeast. They were just hadn't put it out and they would now put it out for everybody. Um, and I, I just wonder when I think about your experience of those primitive groceries, whatever you want to call them, do the people of, of Cuba know that their that their relatives, say in Miami or just anywhere in America or lots of other more developed countries, there there's plenty of food all the time to buy when you want. Oh yeah, they know that. Um, I, I was also noted. I, I guess I could have figured it out before I got there, but I also noted that the very large fraction of people who have family just in the U.S. or, or certainly abroad. Um, and they, almost all of them were volunteer, you know, why they weren't gone yet. And they would give an explanation and when they were going, um, you know, maybe when I'm a few years from retirement, then I'm going to go to my daughter's house or, um, so they know, you know, I have immediate family there. Um, that's, that's one way that they know. I recently, uh, the immediate families been allowed to visit a fair bit and they come back with suitcases full of stuff. Uh, you can't put liquid milk in the suitcase, but a lot of powdered milk goes in the, yeah. in the suitcase, uh, television sets. Um, you can bring, I think five bags in. And so a lot of the things that they have came from an American store. I think, you know, when, the, when the, in the cold war, when, when you would tell, uh, Russians, communists that, I should mention, by the way, for those listening at home, if you don't know, Cuba is a communist country um, and it's run by a dictator uh, who kind of through the bureaucracy decides who owns what, where, prices, et cetera, availability. Um, but when you'd say to people during the Cold War to Russians that, you know, Americans live better, um, I think – or when Khrushchev came here, I think in um, – in the 50s, maybe early 60s, I think it was early 60s, uh, I think he assumed that the profusion of material well-being that he saw was a stage show. Uh, you know, there was a thing in, in the Soviet Union called Potemkin Village where visitors would come and be shown a, a thriving place that was a sham, a theater, to, to deceive people about how easy life was there. Uh, Potemkin backwards, I had to write it down, but it's Nikmatop. I wonder if people thought Soviets who came to the United States thought they were getting a Nikmatop village, a sort of anti-Potemkin village of fake prosperity, uh, but in fact was real. Um, it, is there – it's hard to know, of course. You probably didn't talk in detail with people, but I wonder if they – when they see things on TV or they hear from their relatives whether they think it's exaggerated. And of course, immigrants – to the United States and in the late 19th century we were told the streets were paved with gold. They were, they were told how fabulous it was. And of course it wasn't true. It was exaggerated, uh, but it wasn't so exaggerated compared to say rural Poland where many of those immigrants came from. Uh, and similarly, I would think it'd be hard to exaggerate the difference between a thriving American city in Florida, anywhere in Florida versus Havana. I, I, I didn't, sense that kind of attitude. I, like I said, a lot of them were holding American goods. Uh, that's what they had put their hands, uh, own hands on them. So I don't know that there was any grounds to be skeptical. I'm just thinking, I think if you took, you know, if you went to a Costco or a modern giant Safeway standard Walmart supermarket in the United States and you took someone from Havana there 
uh, I think the, that gap between the, the profusion and the reality they live under would be shocking. Yeah, there's no doubt about that. It, it, it's not in their face, the difference. Um, they may be aware of it intellectually, but it's not in their face. That's true. So start philosophically for a minute. I, when um, when Elian Gonzalez was um, – Elian Gonzalez was a uh, was taken to Florida um, out of Cuba, and um, if I remember correctly, uh, I think his mother may have died on the trip. Or anyway, he was with relatives in in Florida, and his father requested that he be returned. We never knew, couldn't know whether his father was under pressure from the from Castro to, to, to just say that this was in the um, 1990s and uh, the U S government made the decision to return Elian to his father. And this was a cause for a lot of conversation. Uh, I'll never forget though, that one pundit uh, said he was lucky to have the opportunity to grow up in a country that was not as materialistic as the United States uh, not as focused on money, uh, more egalitarian, uh, less a more equal distribution of income, and so um, he was fortunate. I I found that to be a a bizarre thing to say for a lot of reasons. That one of them being that the material well being of the United States, which is what we're talking about right now, relative to Cuba's. Only one of the many reasons that I think most people would prefer to stay here than live in Cuba and uh, the guards face uh, south. They keep people from leaving. They don't stop people from uh, coming in to Cuba. There aren't that. It's not a line. The lines to get out, not to get in. But I, did you have any reflections on that um, in terms of just the well-being? I, there are certainly things about a uh, free market system that can be tough on one's uh, emotional well-being. It, it is competitive. It tends to – can emphasize material things uh, unnecessarily, overly. Uh, did you have any thoughts on that while you are there? Yeah, I was, I was interested uh, in that. I was looking hard and asking about, you know, are there people who came back? Are, are there people who say came from another – Latin American country and chose to come to Cuba. I had trouble finding those people. Um, so that's, that's one aspect is just the voting with their feet. And like you said, the feet and the oars and the boats seem to go in one direction. Um, the other thing that I, I wasn't so aware of, I, I, I was aware you, you had really incomprehensibly large famines in, under Stalin and under Mao, but not really in Cuba. Um, but I heard a lot of people talking about the special period, um, which they described as starving. Now, they didn't starve to death, but they talked about the malnutrition that they endured, the lengths that they would go to to get food. They, the father may have walked 20 miles out into the country to tend a, a little garden that he had put together because there was just no food to find for the family in the, in the city. Um, and they, they vividly remember anyone my age or even younger vividly remembered what they could being very hungry, um, literally hungry. Um, and worried about survival. And most of them did survive in the sense of not dropping dead from starvation, but they were very worried about surviving. And that's not something that you run into in America too often. Yeah, I don't want to, um, I think, I just think it's important to, to make it clear that, uh, especially as an economist, that money isn't everything uh, and material well-being isn't everything, but it's – you do have – you don't want to be hungry and you do you do like a roof over your head, especially uh, if it's raining. Um, 
But when I was thinking about Elian Gonzalez, um, I was thinking that, you know, it's not so much that he'd have more stuff. Uh, he'd have more pairs of shoes if he had stayed in Miami, which he would have, uh, I suspect. And he would have had more video games and more toys and more uh, more food and more beef, et cetera. But that's not really what makes life better. It is part of why people leave poor countries to come to a richer country, certainly. But for me, when I was thinking about that five-year-old boy, my, my thought was, which place will let him flourish? Which place will let him express himself? Which place will let his creativity um, come alive? Which place will his life have more meaning? And that's a tougher question. Uh, I think there are parts of it that are pretty open and shut, but there are parts of it that aren't. And I, you know, I, I'm really asking when you saw, and of course you can't see this in a week, but but walking around, did you get the feeling that it was a, you know, a, a somewhat happy place or a dysfunctional place, or just you know, is it just a place where people don't happen to have? nice apartments and food, or is there something more going on underneath the surface that's more important than food and money that was part of their lives? Well, they definitely had part of their lives that were more than than the food and the money. Um, not sure I viewed it as attractive necessarily, but it, no doubt about that. I mean, there's a thriving arts area there, people dancing, those sort of activities. Not not everybody's into that by any means, but there's a segment of people who who exercise that. Um, I did kind of think when I, I'd been to the Dominican Republic um, and I was there and I had asked, you could guess what year it was, I asked, could you take me to where Sammy Sosa grew up, which was a very poor area, piled up with garbage really. Um, and he seeing the people there and they're, they're the people I saw as they appeared happy to me. They they were smiling and, um, the, the Cuban people weren't as, as happy as that. Um, it, it's not that they were running around complaining or anything like that, but it, I made that kind of that comparison and they're, they look to be, I mean, struggling. And for example, there are very few vehicles for them, so they're walking, and it's hot. Um, and the, there aren't many buses, and the buses that are there are just overflowing, literally overflowing with people. Um, and that's what they're dealing with every day. But that's what they're used um, to. You know, it's not, uh, you know, my, my, my parents grew up in Memphis in the 1930s uh, without air conditioning, which would be unbearable for, for me. Uh, but to them, they don't, they didn't think of it that way. So the fact that they walk in the heat, I don't know, do they care? Is it really a source of, is it great? Is it dispiriting to them? I don't know. I didn't look like they were enjoying themselves as <laughs> much as the Dominicans were uh -huh. in Sammy Sosa's neighborhood. Um, what did, what did you learn? When you think back on the trip, you saw some things you hadn't seen. You got some firsthand knowledge of, of life in this peculiar publicly run, um, you know, it's, it's, it, it is in some sense a police state, but my impression is it's not a police state like the Nazis or the Stalin's time. It's not as fearsome. Yeah. You can't, I assume you can't criticize the regime much, but people seem to go about their lives and were they, I assume they didn't, you didn't mention it. They don't seem to be in fear. So you got to observe this firsthand. What, what in, what did you learn besides what was valuable to you f from the experience? I'm not sure to begin with that. I, I can think of some items like I would. I learned how I call it the Castros, I call it the regime, or the other revolutionaries, how they dealt with opposition um, and it's really very different than Stalin and Mao. In Stalin and Mao, they had the mass purges and these huge famines um, and that took care of a lot of their opponents. Um, that's not what happened 
in Cuba that they migrated. Um, of course, I was aware of the migration. I guess I probably should have mentioned my aunt moved from Cuba to Naperville in 1959. Um, but she's just one example of many people who were on the opposite side of Castro and Che and everybody, and, uh, and they I, left. Well, I think they killed a bunch of people and imprisoned them in the early days for sure. Um, so I don't think it was like a just a peaceful migration, right? Well, yeah, I mean, the reason my aunt left is so they didn't get killed, but it, it's on, I, I think it's on a much smaller scale than the Stalin and the Mao. Um, and I think because migration was an option. And actually, the, the dynamics of the migration I found pretty interesting. And that, you know, I, I learned that the, there really is a wedge that's been driven between um, the Cubans outside of Cuba and the Cubans inside. It, it, it's a strange relationship because, of course, the Cubans outside are sending money to those inside and even coming to visit and bringing stuff. Um, although not for the entire society. There were, especially the blacker Cubans would have many, much less likely to have American contacts. But um, the Americans in Cuba are really angry at, at Castro to this day. I mean the Cubans in America. Yeah, in America. Sorry, Cubans in America are, are really angry, and they still remember that that's, you know, that's my house, that's my farm that you, you took from me or from my father and brother or uncle. Um, and they're angry about that, and that's probably some of the source of American policies against Cuba. Um, the Cubans there aren't angry in that way. Um, and in fact, maybe some of them. Well, that's because they're living in the farm where the. <laughs> some, right. some of them are the beneficiaries of it, but that, I, you're making a deeper point. So I, I apologize. Uh, yeah. But there, that's another interesting dynamic of it that they. So they're maybe living in somebody else's. Well, what was 1959 with somebody else's house or somebody else's farm? And I think some of them view the Castros today as maybe the only thing standing between them and having to give it back. Yeah. Um, and so that's in terms of, if you think of it from Castro's point of view, you know, taking care of his opponents with the migration solution rather than the murder solution is different. And maybe also part of the reason why he outlasted um, or his regime outlasted the uh, communist regimes in China and, and in Russia, Soviet Union. Let's talk about the embargo, uh, which uh, I've long been in favor of getting rid of, and Obama has recently, President Obama has recently um, at least lifted some aspects of it. I don't know to what degree yet and how long that will take, and but certainly we're on a different path. And as you pointed out, uh, Cuban Americans in the United States, uh, particularly in Florida, were very adamant about that. Uh, embargo, and then probably the reason it existed, and certainly uh, felt very, very strongly about it, and were very upset when it was have, have been upset when it with the prospect of it lifting. Um, but it seems to me that it has been a perennial excuse for uh, Castro as to why uh, his country has not done as well, say, as Puerto Rico, which you write about, uh, or other similar places. Over time, over the time period since the Cuban Revolution of 1959, and so, what are your thoughts on the embargo? And did you hear much about it while you were there from Cubans? Yeah, but it, before I went there, I guess um, I would have been inclined to approximate. I would emphasize it's an approximation, but approximate the impact of the embargo is zero. Um, because they can import trade. from other countries, obviously. Yeah, yeah. This, the, the goods take a different route, and what's the big deal? Kind of would have been my attitude uh, before I went there. And now I, I may be a little more hesitant. and I, I would say that there is a real effect of the embargo on the standard of living of the people. Um, maybe more than transaction costs or some way to trivialize it. Um, so the, the, 
that, that's kind of my analysis of it. That the people talked about the embargo a lot, um, but they said that you know the embargo is it has an effect on us, but let's not make let's not misunderstand that as the only problem or even the number one problem that we have. And they even explained to me that Raul, not not Fidel, but Raul had been saying the same thing lately, that let's not blame the embargo for for our problems. Now, I figure where Raul's coming from is that the embargo might get lifted and then he <laughs> doesn't want to have to backpedal too far. So yeah, this is a way point. of preempting that probably. But that really makes the point that that the embargo was a very powerful, potentially propaganda weapon for the, the Castros uh, over the last 50 years, 60 years, and that getting rid of it is going to make them um, – it exposes them. It says, OK, you've got – now it's up to you. you got no excuses. You know, your policies are on the line. And you know, my view – you write about the fact that internet access is not very good. It's limited. Uh, but, you know, the internet and other tourists, people like you going there, it it's hard to sustain that uh, regime and that level of control of people's lives, where they work, what they make, and where they live. Um in a modern era, it's going to be very challenging. I just can't see the system sustaining itself for, say, the next, in 20 years, maybe 10 years. I think it'll be essentially – they'll start like the Chinese. They'll open up certain things, and then they'll lose control of it, and Cuba will well, change. Can I, be, can I be a devil's advocate a little bit? Yeah, sure. There's this um, series of books coming out every other year called Cuban Communism. And I, I have the 11th edition. I think there's 12 or 13 of them. So it's been going on for a period of 20 years or something like that. These, every edition says what you said. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, I hate to laugh. I'm laughing at myself. I mean, I just, it's a tragedy. So I don't, I don't really, uh, there's nothing funny about it, but it is funny from a social science perspective. And that, that's kind of the, one of the things I was looking for is, you know, That regime's passed some kind of market test. Okay, it's not a free market and everything like that, but they, they've they held their position for a long time. I think of the Qaddafis. You know, we, yeah, we all like to say that Qaddafi was a bad guy, but he held his job for a long time. He was doing something that was of some value, and now that he's gone, we can kind of see the value that he was delivering. And that's why one thing I was kind of looking for was there was, are people getting some kind of value out of this regime, What and what is it? And I, I don't know the full answer, um, but I, like I mentioned, the story of the literacy program, and there were elements of that that there was pro, some pride um, that they had. Um, and you know, we got to think about what's the alternative when the when the Castro's regime is gone. What's going to be there instead? And is it going to be a Libya or is it going to be a modern? Uh, 21st century China, I, I don't know. Well, we don't know what a modern 21st China is going to look like in five years either. That They've got a different set of problems, and it's not clear that their current path is sustainable to me anyway. But I'm going to go back to this question of um, passing a market test. It's not, not much of a market test, right? If I have guns and I can exploit people and force them to basically enslave them, in the sense that I can extract profit from them, I can keep their wages artificially low, I can tax them and keep the proceeds for my buddies. That system, which is a huge part of human history, uh, right? D democratic uh, free market regimes are the exception, not the rule. But most of human history is about the exploitation of the powerful by the powerful of the powerless. I don't consider that much of a market test other than that no one else came along and took it away from them. So I don't – the fact that that there are good things about the system, I don't see them as 
as it's not obvious to me those are things the regime has provided that has created a, a stable system. To me, it's more they had the power. They used it to enrich themselves and, and to enrich their friends who kept them in power. That is the Castros. And yeah, maybe they believed whatever they, their ideology was. It doesn't matter. But I don't really see the longevity of the Castro regime as telling me anything about how effective they were in in making the citizens happy, maybe pacifying them. I don't, I don't know. Doesn't seem to be much of a not a very attractive market test to me. Yeah, well, I, again, I think of the Libya or even the Saddam Hussein examples that um, when they were forcibly removed externally, things got a lot worse. Um, yeah, but that's not the same point, right? I I, I, I agree with you, uh, but I, well, think I people I think it's, I, people who who lived under them understood that the alternative was even worse. Oh, but it's not a menu. You don't get to choose, right? If you said, um, I think the mistake we make in evaluating these as as observers and social scientists and political scientists is to say, gee, wouldn't it be great if if Cuba if Cuba were were like Florida, they'd be thriving? Well, that's silly. They can't be like Florida. We don't have a we don't have the roadmap to get there from here. And so, if we if just for example, if we had I think the United States did try to assassinate Castro in the 1960s shortly after the revolution, or at least considered it. And if we had successfully done that, yes, certainly they might have been replaced by something worse. So that says, you know, be careful in what you wish for. Don't always be confident that getting rid of something bad leads to something better. But I don't think it's the sa- that's the same thing as saying uh, because they – kept away something worse, say, by being in power, that that they provided something of value. I mean, for example, the crime rates are low in dictatorships often because the police are everywhere and nobody wants to go to the prisons. And that's a you know it's a well known uh factoid. I think I think it's probably even true. Um so does that tell you that's a side benefit, that's a silver lining of a very dark cloud. That that in um, you know communist Russia or Nazi Germany there were wasn't that much theft or murder, but that isn't what kept the regime going. It wasn't like oh well you know we'd rather have freedom, but if we had freedom we'd have a high murder rate, so we don't want to have that. It's just that you know that, that's one of the side effects of having a dictatorship or a totalitarian state is that you don't get a lot of murder, you don't get a lot of gang warfare, say in a or tribal warfare in a. System like Iraq's okay, but that isn't that system's not designed to do that. The, the leaders aren't giving that as a way to quote please the market. It's just a side benefit of their own exploitation. See, I'm not sure I, I agree with that. I mean, there are, okay. they need support. You say they have guns, but they, you can't have a gun pointed at everybody's head at everybody's mo- at every moment. I mean, you need some kind of support, and people. Have, who are on the margin of support have to think about, you know, do I want to be unsupported? Do I want to slip the poison in the guy's lunch or whatever action they might take? And perhaps some of them are aware of, you know, maybe I'd be doing more harm than good here by resisting. I've obviously harmed myself and I'm going to harm my country as well. So I'm not going to do it. Yeah, I understand that. I, I just, I just not, I'm not convinced that, when we look at uh, totalitarian, authoritarian regimes, that their stability is – thinking of it as, quote, passing a market test is the same way we think of, I don't know, Walmart doing well for a long period of time. I, it just doesn't strike me as the right metaphor. I don't know. OK. Well, I'd agree to disagree on that one. OK. Uh, are you going to go back? You want to go back, uh, and and finally, do you have any? Despite my optimism, which is empirically uh, has to be questioned because of the point you made about the book, uh, suggesting for a long time that this is coming. Yeah, you know, it actually reminds me of the sign. It's like the sign in the bar: "Free beer tomorrow." 
Uh, right. It's a permanent sign. Uh, you know, freedom tomorrow. But I do think it will come. And I, uh, I'm also reminded of the this quote about Marx. He was so far sighted that his predictions haven't even come true yet. So I'm going to fall into my uh, one of. The, I'm going to make my Marxist prediction that that freedom will come to the Cuban people in slow and and perhaps steady ways over the next 10, 20 years. But I could be wrong. So are you optimistic? And will you go back? And uh, and what would you expect to find if you did go back in the next few years? Um, yeah, I've wondered about whether I would go back. I, I guess I'm on the margin there. Um, prob- probably would. Uh, but it's not at the top of, top of my list of anything, I guess. Um, <laughs> optimistic in what sense? I mean, the, for the Cuban people, I, I am optimistic that they're going to have more opportunities to leave. And, you know, that that's a choice that they might be able to make that they wouldn't have made in the old days or wouldn't have been available. Um, so at, at that level, I think, Freedom is tomorrow for a number of them. Uh, whether it be freedom on that island, that's it's harder to say. I definitely hope for it, but it doesn't make it happen. My guest today has been Casey Mulligan. Casey, thanks for being on Econ Talk. You're welcome. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.